and I was climbing the rocks, like trying to get to the sea, because I think at that point in my life, I just, I just didn't want to do it anymore. I didn't want to be here. I didn't want to put my parents through what I was putting them through at the time. Hi, I'm Katie James. I play for AFC Bournemouth Women and I work for AFC Bournemouth Community Sports Trust and this is my journey with mental health. Being brought up was a bit, I wasn't challenging, but my mum obviously wasn't in the best sort of financial position when I was younger. Um, my mum and my dad broke up when I was quite young as well, so it was a bit of a challenging upbringing for me. I was alright going through my first school, uh, middle school, and then when I got to senior school, that's when things started to get sort of really difficult for me. That transition into high school for sort of any young girl is, is a difficult time. Um, I think it's a time where there's a lot of pressure to figure out who you are, what you are, like what you want to be. Um, so not only like was I challenged with my sort of feelings about my sexuality, I was trying to figure out what road I wanted to go down with my job and things like that. So I think for any young girl, that's a really, really difficult time. Um, but for me, <laughs> particularly with this whole sort of realising I was gay, um, it was quite hard to come to terms with. A lot of the girls at school were obviously into sort of their makeup, boys, um, whereas I'm the other end of the, the playground running around kicking the ball with the boys. Um, probably at that stage wanting to be in that group, not with the girls. It, was, it wasn't easy um, being, feeling so alone, I think, in that time. I didn't really know who to talk to. Obviously, and now I think it's a lot more talked about in the, in the media. There's a lot more people coming out within sport and things like that. But at the time when I was younger, there wasn't really any of that. So I didn't have anyone that I could sort of look to and think, OK, it's all right for me to be this way. So a lot of it I kept suppressed. I used to get called names in, in the playground when I was younger, obviously running around with the boys and stuff. People always used to say to me, oh, you're a lesbian, like blah, blah, blah. And I would just get really upset about it because even though I knew deep down that I was, I didn't want to admit it. So I just ran away from it and didn't really sort of talk to anyone or deal with it properly. It sort of spiraled as such. Um, I didn't want to get out of bed. I wouldn't go to school. Um, my parents used to have a battle with me every morning trying to drag me out of my bed. I remember my dad coming in and he literally tipped me off my mattress like, come on, you're going to school and I would just refuse. Um, and I think at the time I didn't really understand what I was sort of feeling. But now looking back on it, I think that was kind of the start of me falling into this depression episode where I just shut down completely. I didn't want to talk to anyone. Um, I hated my parents for trying to make me go to school and put me in a position where I felt so uncomfortable, even though at the time they had no idea what I was going through mentally because I wouldn't talk about it. Yeah, so when I was in year 10 and I stopped going to school, my parents eventually got taken to court because my attendance got that bad where I would never go. They kind of took a lot of the brunt of what I was going through. Um, there was a lot of frustration, I think, on, on their side. Uh, there was a, a period of time where my mum asked my dad to sort of take me in and for me to live there because she was struggling with sort of how difficult I was. Um, Obviously, I know she cared, she didn't do it because she was trying to get rid of me. She just didn't know what to do with me. But my parents sort of took a lot of my emotions on. And I think now looking back on it, it's probably one of, I wouldn't say regrets, but it's something that I look back on and I really struggle with is what I put my parents through during that time. Um, I just wish that I was a bit more communicative with them with how I was feeling because I think as much as I was lost trying to find who I was, I think they were just as lost trying to help me. So my dad also got diagnosed with cancer. Um, at the time, I thought, I think maybe as any girl that age might think going through what they were, that it was, it was my fault. Like the stress I put him under was the reason he had developed this disease. So again, that was another another thing that sort of spiralled me down. Um, and I think at the age of sort of 14, 15, I made friends with probably the wrong people at that time um, who would buy me alcohol and things like that. And that was definitely something that I used as a child to 
try and cope with all of these emotions. Along with that sort of alcohol abuse, uh, I would try and overdose when I was drinking. Um, I got myself in a state a few times where I was completely unresponsive. My parents would have to ring an ambulance and take me to hospital. There was one particular time that I can remember quite well was I was down by Pool Harbour and I had been drinking and I had like a bottle of vodka and I was climbing the rocks like trying to get to the sea because I think at that point in my life I just I just didn't want to do it anymore. I didn't want to be here. I didn't want to put my parents through what I was putting them through at the time. Um, and I think for me that was that was my way out was how can I end what I'm going through and how can I make life easier for my parents um, which sounds silly when I say it out loud now because obviously that's not going to make my parents life any easier but I just didn't see any other way and yes self-harm as well was something that I used to quite often use as as a way to sort of punish myself um, I think a couple of times my mum's come in and my arms have just been absolutely covered in blood. Um, I think to the point one time where they had to call an ambulance and rush me into hospital because I'd cut my arms that badly, um, which is part of the reason now why I've sort of got my tattoos and stuff is because I'm not ashamed of my scars, but it's also something that I don't want to have to look at all the time and think about because it was such a difficult period in my life that I don't want to be reminded of it. So throughout most of my depression, football was a massive, a massive part of how I would cope as well. Um, it's probably the one thing in my life that I didn't run away from. I continued to go to training, um, literally get out of bed, go to training, come home and get back in bed. That was probably what I would do in a day and not really move much else. I got into playing beach soccer at that age. Um, which gave me some opportunities to sort of travel and experience a bit more of life. Um, and I think those kind of things put me in positions where I was learning more about myself. I was lucky enough that I was surrounded by some really good people, which Beat Shocker was part of that for me, bringing those people into my life. Um, and I started to talk more about how I was feeling, uh, confiding in people around me. Um, and also I actually engaged in counselling and I think that's something that has really changed my life. I think there's this big stigma around it that going to counselling means, I don't know, you're, you're crazy or you're, you're insane, but honestly I see it as, as a way to check in with myself. Um, it's something that I still do now. I go to counselling every week. Um, I sometimes go into those sessions and I think, I don't even know what I'm going to talk about today, but there's always something, um, there's always something you can talk about and I think checking in with yourself all the time is, is so important and just talking through emotions even if you're just saying them out loud I think it's a, it's a big step in becoming more self-aware and really understanding what's going on. I think talking about how you're feeling is, is so important. I know it's difficult, it took me a long time to realise that that was something that was really going to help me on sort of my journey to where I'm at now. But I would say for me talking has been the biggest part of me changing my ways and changing my life. Um, I think it's quite easy when you're in that position to sit there and think that no one's really going to understand what you're going through. And I was in that position when I was younger. I, I didn't think anyone would have any clue what it was that was going on in my brain. I thought I was the only one that felt that way. Um, and at times now, even at 26 years old, I, I think, I'm not going to talk about this. No one knows what's going on. Like, I sound silly, but there's so many people out there that are, are going through the same things, um, having the same struggles. And I think talking about those and it becoming more normalised in, in conversation is, is a really important step for the stigma surrounding mental health. 15, 14, 15 year old girls going to, to school, all on their phones, on social media. Um, I think it's so easy for you to sit there and look at those videos of all these sort of influencers and people who are photoshopped and think 
why don't I look like that? And I think that is a, is a huge part in today's society of younger girls or even boys, anyone really just starting to paint this picture of who they should be. It's just, it's, it's almost scary to think that you can, you can paint this perfect picture of yourself. Social media can be quite dangerous. Still something I probably struggle to say now, but yeah, I'm, I'm very proud of myself. I think I look at myself sort of 10 years ago and I didn't even think I was gonna be alive, to be quite honest. I didn't, I didn't know how I was gonna ever make it through life. I didn't want to make it through life. Um, I think for me, I didn't really think I was, I was gonna sort of see my, my 20s. Um, so to sit here now and, and say that I've sort of been through the things that I have, um, the experiences I've had with Beach Shocker, uh, playing grass football, obviously now being at Bournemouth and being surrounded by so many sort of amazing people here as well is, I finally got to a point in my life, I think, where now I'm, I'm really settled and I'm really happy with the life that I've got and the people that I've got around me. I think it's easy for, for people to say, oh, you need to check in on your friends and stuff like that. But I had lots of friends at the time who were checking on me and I would brush it off and say, yeah, I'm fine. Um, I think it's, it's easy to give those standard responses of, I'm okay. Um, and I think a lot of people do that who are struggling with mental health. They almost sort of lead a double life. So I think in order for that to change, I just, more and more people need to talk about their vulnerabilities and have hard conversations and just normalize that not being okay is okay. Um, it's part of life. And there's obviously a lot of things that go on in people's, people's brains that may scare them or might be scary to say out loud, but I can probably guarantee there's, there's a lot of other people who have had those thoughts and have similar thoughts. And I think just having those conversations with those people around you is only gonna sort of encourage other people to be vulnerable and hopefully as time goes on, talking about it more and more will allow for people to, to feel like that they can sort of confide and get help and it becomes less of an issue, I think.